Attention. Okay, so I'm Walker. I hope you all know that. My project was on threshold wallet security, and I worked with uh, Stephen Goldsider and Harry on it. Uh, so, th so the motivation of this project stems from shared wallets, because uh, as businesses move forward with hopefully Bitcoin getting some more traction in the business world, if you ever want to authorize some kind of group transaction, you don't have the same amount of financial checks on it as you do in a normal banking system. Like, you can't reverse a transaction, you can't really take someone to court unless you figure out what address it was transferred to. Like, you don't really have any recourse if someone up and steals all the money. And then there's the other big thing that multi-state transactions are limited to 15 of them. So let's say we did shared property of uh, ownership of this class. Like who's gonna run the show? So let's have a scheme where either all of the students can vote together to get something, or Arvin or Joe can go, with one of you having seniority to configure that out. <laughs> So there's no way with 15 keys, if we're distributing a key to each person, and then additional one to them, that we could fit that into the, a traditional multi-state scheme. And we don't really want to fork Bitcoin, because A, that's completely impractical, and B, even if we could, if we increase multi-stake to just some arbitrary threshold, either we would hit that, or transactions could reach some ridiculously large size, and no miner would ever want to pay for that. So the idea then is we can move to a different kind of crypto called threshold cryptography, where kind of the idea is instead of distributing keys to people and then having that be equivalent to power in the system, you distribute key shares, which th this differs from crypto scheme to crypto scheme and signing algorithm to signing algorithm. But the general idea is you have some original key, you split it up over some kind of protocol, and then you require a threshold of K of N shares to reconstruct the key with uh, a lot of these schemes have the additional property of if you have a higher threshold of, of uh, key shares, you're able to reconstruct a signature without ever reconstructing the key in whole, which that's a big deal that we'll get into later. So the classic example, I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of in some kind of InfoSec class is uh, Shamir's secret sharing. I'm so close to saying secret sharing. But uh, the whole idea is that you represent a uh, polynomial over a finite field, or you represent a key as a polynomial over a finite field, and you use the property that you need for an n degree polynomial, you need points on it to figure out what that polynomial is. Like if you have a parabola, you can't figure out what that parabola is for key points. So the idea is that you'll make that, split it up into points, distribute those, and then you can use those to reconstruct the key. But that only works for DSA, which is an RSA backed algorithm. And DSA generally has a lot of research behind it for threshold crypto, as opposed to Bitcoin, which uses the elliptic curve digital signing algorithm, which makes things a lot more hairy. But so th threshold crypto, like I said, is really attractive as an option for getting more secure access protocols. Because if we design our scheme correctly, you're able to you're able to create a system such that you're never reconstructing the key on any device. So that way, if someone has malware on one of your computers or one of your employees is particularly malicious, there's no point in the process where they can really overhear the whole key and then in a later transaction, present that key, that SIG hash, and then steal everyone's money. And the other side benefit, this is much smaller compared to everything else, because Kind of the, the ideal use case in the future is that like a large business would have some like expense account where people have to authorize transactions out of there. If you're like a small business or if you if you're running a small unlicensed illegal business, it's very easy for you to just keep everything off the grid because you're only having one transaction. So you're not creating these clusters of addresses that Shubro and Charlie and Dan talked about earlier. So ECDSA has a couple more difficulties as opposed to DSA, in that whereas DSA you just really need a key share, you need a private key and associated nonce, and then the nonce is multiplicative inverse. So for each transaction, you'll always have your same share of the private key, but then each transaction you'll need a new K and a new K inverse. So if you have the whole K, then that implies that with your key share you're able to reconstruct the key, so that's not good. And 
K inverse also requires you to have, oh, and, and K inverse also requires that you have K as well, so you need to figure out a way of distributing things, which the very easy idea is that you have some central trusted party who every now and then calculates a bunch of these and then hands them out, but then again, that kind of leads us to having a central point of failure, so that really undoes a lot of the security benefits of this system unless the person who is in charge of it has something really big hanging over their head. So a couple of the threshold schemes that exist currently are uh, Langford has a really interesting one where you do have a trusted dealer and so the dealer calculates for transactions a bunch of Ks which are the nonces a bunch of the multiplicative inverses and then I believe the multiplicative inverse times the order of the elliptic curve that you're operating on, and then sp splits those into shares and distributes them to a group of people. And the idea is there that you'll be able to reconstruct the key or reconstruct the signature with the same amount of uh, key shares, which that would get us the property that you never have to reconstruct the key on a device, which that's definitely a big plus. But the issue is that you have that central party you may or may not trust or may or may not exist in the first place and you have a limited number of signatures because you have to you have to have the central party generate a ton at once otherwise you're going to be constantly requesting for them to do this and it's a sort of pretty involved process uh, Gennaro and a group of people created a interactive scheme that does not require you to have a central party which is nice but because of the way the scheme works out, you cannot have arbitrary access protocols. We can't, like say we couldn't have 505 to sign it and 505 to reconstruct it. There's a threshold on, you need n plus one over two to reconstruct the key. So say for five, you need three people. But then for the signature, since we have three as the minimum to reconstruct the key, the minimum to just make the signature without doing that is also is five. So in this case, we can do it, but you can reconstruct the key with fewer, so that leaves you open to another security issue of if you have a smaller group of people willing to negotiate and then make the key themselves and then embezzle from you, which isn't that good. So you want to try and keep those two values the same. The idea, though, for Gennaro is that the uh, K is going to be so small in relation to the number of shares out there that it wouldn't matter too much. But then another interesting scheme that this project I worked with uh, Steve and Terry on was a Mackenzie and Writer who came up with an interactive four round protocol where it's just two parties. One party initiates a transit, initiates a message, which in this case is a Bitcoin transaction. I do a partial sign, I pass it off, they do a partial sign and it goes back and forth one more time. And then you have a properly signed ECDSA message without ever having to reconstruct the key on any device. So the Langford, like I said, is really good when you have a trusted third party. And Gennaro is what you're going to have to do for any group of people larger than two where you don't have some trusted party. You can kind of massage d these constants down a bit if you use uh, hardware devices that basically will automatically sign any transaction that comes before them. But then that also creates a position where the idea with threshold security more towards a physical problem where, okay, I'd have to compromise like 10 or 15 people to get at this money. Whereas if you have hardware devices, then you move into the realm of these can be compromised somehow, key material can be stolen, and then the whole sec security of the system decreases. And also just some expense, but it's interesting. So the writer, the big thing is that it doesn't reconstruct the key. And uh, Stephen Goldfeder implemented this in uh, Java recently, and it was used as a back backend for this project. So for each round, you need to store your p portion of key material, a secure random number generator, a, uh, I'm, no, I'm going to butcher this, I think it's French, Pilier public key, which is a crypto system that's based on the idea that I get a no right? Okay. The key to French is don't pronounce anything you absolutely don't have to pronounce. Okay. So just, it. just go it's from the beautiful. beginning to the end. Just read through yeah. it. <laughs> so the idea is instead of RSA where it's like intractable to factor something, it's intractable to calculate the nth residue class of a number. 
and then curve parameters and a couple other just very large integers that are used for intermediate calculations. So it was built on top of uh, multi-bit in Bitcoin J. Multi-bit's just like an open source white wallet. I think we might have mentioned it in class once when discussing like full wallets versus white wallets. It's just a, a very standard swing application with a bunch of actions in there. And we, all, we added a views and actions that created a shared wallet, displayed QR codes that would hand over a certificate and a password that was then used to initiate communication between the phone and the computer. And it would send a transaction to the phone to be signed. And then the phone app would scan the, a QR code using Google's DXing uh, package. It would scan it, break it up into the password and the certificate, and then use that with network service discovery to make an initial connection with the computer, negotiate and say, like, yes, I'm the phone that you are trying to put this wallet onto. And then you receive some key material, and then the next time you can receive transaction data and you sign in rounds. So the general application flow is that you make the wallet on the computer, and that'll, ge that'll make a portion of the key and store the relevant parameters on your end. Generate a password and the certificate, put that into a QR code, display that on in, in a multi-bit pane. You'll scan with the phone and then connect over just a standard SSL socket to make a remote key and then just store all the other parameters on the phone. And then you'll authorize your transaction on either end which really authorizing it on the phone is just you bundle it into a transaction, send it all over to the computer, and then it does the same process as if you started it on the computer. So you'll receive, the phone receives the first round that was partially signed by the computer, and it goes back and forth until the computer receives the final round. And then the computer relays the whole signed transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain, and it's added once it's mined. So future work is I'm just uh, finishing adding some QR code to the most recent uh, commit of the repository. And then right now, phone transactions are just kind of dummy stuff where I just made a fake transaction using Bitcoin J and then had it relayed through an op like in a file input stream. No, it's an object input stream that we use to just read in keys normally. And then I just want to make sure I can add that from the phone. And Harry's going to show, because I borked my multi-bit build this morning. <laughs> So to sign a message, you'll input the address you want and the message, which this is just, oh, I can just put this. And then this is how we end up authorizing transactions oh. through Bitcoin. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I did here. <laughs> Bad touch. So does anyone have any questions? There's enough chi base in the world that I can make my money. Yeah, so that, so it's, uh, the schema that Stephen implemented was actually written in 2004. So I do not think we could get a patent on that. <laughs> series A is after C round, uh, before the C, uh, Series B. <laughs> and also, I love the 19th century hat parody. The 19th century hat in the wallet. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. I'm, I'm a rich man. <laughs> Is this why we say never go to grad school? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will give Harry his laptop. That might be actually good news for you guys. You guys learned something in this class. <laughs> <laughs>